Talk Show. It's a Daily Talk Show, episode 466. From our makeshift studio at the Overlow Hotel in Woolloomooloo, mm. we have a special guest with us. Dan Illick. Mm, it's good to be with you. Mate. It's good to be with you. As they say, <laughs> when you do media hits, they say, it's good to be with you. <laughs> oh, look, I know you guys don't do this like every day, but what this is what we, media what people do. We, when they, go, they say, good to be with you. What Maybe you've had say? some more experience and did a few more shows. <laughs> you know, have people come in and say, glad, good to be with you. Glad to have you here. What are, what are the other sort of... These are crutch phrases, right? That Yeah. I mean, do you, do you have ins when you're speaking with with guests like how like how you start a conversation uh, I usually try and start off with a joke that puts them on the back foot uh-huh. <laughs> yeah yeah or hits them attacks them personally <laughs> because I, I know that they know that I don't mean it but they have to think about it what they're going to say so it's fine <laughs> what's give us an example this is where this has happened uh, okay uh, uh, Josh so you used to weigh 120 kilos yes well what do you weigh now Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> well, they've actually got, they've got um, <laughs> scales in the bathroom. <laughs> did you, did you test, get on? After, after Ash Williams uh, fat shaming to now finishing Sydney <laughs> with, with, a Dad, <laughs> with a weigh-in. I mean, I have been eating a lot of cheese. The problem is that I'm doing a keto diet but also keeping carbs at the moment. So <laughs> that doesn't a work. That doesn't work. <laughs> it doesn't work. This is, this is the uh, let's throw to the trainer. Does okay. that work? Uh, does not work. <laughs> <laughs> calories in, calories out. Good to be with you is a great way to start something. Mm. Uh and also media people end it with that because I, I like it because it's so cliche. Mm-hmm. But the mm. best the best out was by old mate John Laws who lives in this building down the end of the road, really? down the That's end of the crazy. pier. He you lives know Russell, Russell Crowe lives here too? Russell Crowe also lives here. He, right, he lives in a few places. He, he's, yeah. Right now, he's in Coffs Harbour, but, but he does live here. Uh, I know this because he tweeted this morning. <laughs> Did he? <laughs> yeah, but, um, but John Laws finished a great interview with Lee Sales probably about two years ago. Mm. Uh, <laughs> he said he was drinking whiskey at the time and he said did you enjoy this and Lee said yes I did very much did you every minute of it <laughs> <laughs> and I was like that is how you end an interview I love uh, that uh, Dan you're the real deal I'm looking at your phone right here you, you're listening to Ken Burns a master filmmaker podcast yeah. or is that a, a video it is a podcast and you will laugh because it's Tim Ferriss is uh, it yeah, yeah. yeah Tim Ferriss is interviewing I don't listen to Tim Ferriss a lot but when he does have someone interesting on I do want to hear what they have to say he well, gets good people Ken mm. Burns all I know him for was the transition effect where you would zoom in is this we are alarm. experiencing a real life oh, fire wow. alarm here at the Overload, can, one of Sydney's least on fire buildings. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's it's on fire because it's so hot right now. It's <laughs> I, it's that's what happens. You get the Illich effect. Turn oh, up, wow. bang, building turns on fire. I don't. I hope we don't have to yeah, get out of here. That's yeah. just. Bit annoying. I hope it's a. Um, I appreciate Dan's just. He's a I'm fucking just, content king. Just, no, but that's the thing. You are a professional. Uh, I mean, I, there's only professionals that listen to Ken yeah, Burns podcast to even know who he is. The transition effect guy. Yeah. Um, no. I saw you first on Hungry Beast many many years ago. I remember when the. Um, it was almost like they were searching for the the talent or the, the searching for the people to uh, apply. I know. Um, uh, what's it? Kirk Docker, yeah. someone I know who who became a, a co-host with you. One of Melbourne's favourite sons. Mate, he's amazing. What? Tell us about that journey of entering into Hungry Beast. Uh, Hungry Beast was really interesting for me because I'd kind of had a little bit of TV experience beforehand. I did a sketch show on Channel 10 and then I was directing a TV show in, in Melbourne, uh, Charlie Pickering and Michael Chamberlain's show on the Comedy Channel called uh, The Mansion. It was like a satire show. And then I really wanted to do more stuff on camera, front facing, writing my own, writing and producing my own stuff. And at the time I was making ads and content for um, Get Up and they were like, any kind of funny ads from the mid noughties, they're the ones that I did. (laughs) Uh, And this opportunity came up and I wasn't kind of sure if it was for me because they kind of said they didn't want anyone with experience, but I just really, I really wanted the job. Um, so I really loved Andrew Denton, and I really wanted to work with with really good people and be really challenged. So I put I put some stuff together and sent it in. And um, uh, at the time, I was also being interviewed for jobs at the project that was just starting up. The project was just brand new, hadn't even aired yet, and they were crewing up and building this gigantic machine. And what year op- was that? 2009. Yeah, wow. 2009, yeah. Uh, 10 years ago. We've got our 10-year Hungry Beast 
reunion show this next week actually oh when this airs four days ago get yeah. a ticket in the past um, <laughs> and um, how was the show oh mate just great like oh, we all got hammered how's Kirk oh Kirk was just loose uh, oh, he was always did. asking people personal questions uh, on a scrim it was very difficult um, and I remember going for the interview and the interview was extremely daunting you, you had it was like an hour long interview you were you sat in front of a panel of really experienced producers. Andy Neal, who pro has produced every amazing show the ABC has ever done, including The Chaser. Um, Paige Livingston, uh, Andrew Denton was there. And I think Anita Jacoby was there too. And they just grilled you for half an hour. And then the second, and then you had to do like a fake interview with Andy Neal being a politician. And so that was difficult and then then you were given half an hour to sit in a room by yourself with a video camera with a bunch of props and make up a video <laughs> on the spot and then it was really strange and um uh i i, w I was felt like i was under pressure um a lot for that interview and it was um yeah very 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 tough do you think and those audition processes are, are trying to weed out people that uh, what, are the, what are they trying to find like because I think there's people on TV that are super quirky that might not do well under that circumstance, but would be great for the show. So it's a, an approach. I and mean, what do you think they're actually trying to do to you? Well, I kind of think that they're looking for creativity, maybe, and looking for people who can do, can make stuff with not much. Um, I know you were, you're talking to uh, Kelly, the lean, lean filmmaker. Oh yeah, Kylie, yeah, Kylie, 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 Kylie Eddie, Kylie, Kylie Eddie. Yeah, 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 that was that was a really great chat. Mm. And you know, it's funny like techniques like that she implements uh, and that we all do as content creators online now were kind of just very were starting ten mm. years ago because these platforms were just kind of new. Mm. So I think they're looking for people who can create their own content out of not much and still, still tell a story. And it was grueling, like it was, it was very difficult. Um, I really brought my A game. Uh, I yeah. was really happy with myself. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and in the process that same week, I was going for jobs at the, at the project and they wanted me to direct um, the con field stuff for project. And it was crazy money. Um, and I sent Zapruder's other films an email and I said, oh, hey, I don't know where, pro it was called Project Next back then. I don't know where Project Next is up to, but I've just been offered a job at the project. Um, so if there's, if, if, you know, if, but I'd rather do Project Next than do the project. So Project Next was Hungry Beast? Hungry Beast, yeah. Okay. Yeah. They just kept it under wraps, the name? Yeah, yeah. yeah. There was, it was just, um, and I'm sure the project was called The Project as a Working Title, but they yeah. just kept the name. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it was one of those things. I was walking down Johnson Street in, um, in Fitzroy and my phone rang and it was Andrew Denton and I I said, oh, give me a second, Andrew. And I jumped into like a really expensive furniture store. And he said, hello, Dan, it's Andrew Denton here. And I was like, oh, hello, Andrew. Mm -hmm. said, uh, congratulations, I hear you've got a job at the project. And I said, oh, yes, I do. <laughs> Don't take it. <laughs> You're going to join Project Next. And I was like, oh, great, fantastic. <laughs> so, um, so that started my 10-year career of doing really awesome things for not a lot of money. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, I had, and I learned... I made some of my best friends at the at uh, at Hungry Beast and and got to work with incredible people and um, learn a lot from not only Andrew but all the other senior producers there Anita Jacoby, Paula Kruger, um, John Kazimer, who's just this wonderful brain and Andy Neal was has is always an incredible support whenever you need whenever you get stuck in a tricky situation. What was the learning from that experience? Specifically, from the decided, audition experience. Yeah, not just from the audition experience, but making the decision between one or the other. I guess it's a real fork in the road, or one of those decisions which can really shape you as a creator. I generally try to when I'm picking things for love or money, I'm always picking love, mm -hmm. um, and I, I think I'm. I, I'd like to be financially stable, but I like to create good things, and mm -hmm. I want to create good work that that I feel like. I don't like calling myself an artist, but in many ways it's kind of like that where like, mm. oh, I just want to create lots of really good things mm. um, so people can enjoy and people can be delighted and I can stand back and go, oh man, I've, fuck, mm. I've made some really good things. Yeah. And every now and then I get really um, uh, sad and upset with myself and, and like I'm not doing enough or, uh, or I don't have 
my, my career might not be where I want my career to be or or uh, I just kind of I missed those opportunities or I fucked up opportunities and but then when I am forced to write a bio or something or update my my resume mm-hmm. when I'm looking for the next job mm. I go fuck I've done so much stuff like yeah, yeah. it kind of makes you makes me feel good about the kind of work I've made in the past so right now I put out a tweet, but I deleted it because the grammar was bad. Uh, <laughs> I put out a tweet, last week. I put out a tweet <laughs> last week saying, I'm like the brokest I've been in a long time, yeah. but I'm also the most creatively fulfilled I've been mm. in a long time. So, and I, I Did you I, forget I, a comma? Like, what was the issue? Uh, with I said I'm the brokest I've ever been, but I'm also the most creative, f- creatively fulfilled I've ever been. But it like, kind of wasn't... I fucked up the grammar somehow. And yeah, I was like, yeah. that's disgusting. Why not, even, not even take two? <laughs> no, no. You can use because that it was... All the engagement was, was Gone, there. gone, <laughs> gone, gone. You can't rebuild. Oh, man. I, I lost so much Twitter split rev on that tweet. Hemorrhaging. 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 That tweet could have paid for this coffee. <laughs> but uh, I did. <laughs> I thank you. I think yeah, cheers, yeah, cheers, 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 cheers. Do I get a cheers even if it's Mate. iced? Yeah, you can have it. Thank you. Oh, Mate, you've got a baby cup. Are my uh, hands just big. What are you talking about? I'm massive. So uh, I think it was like the. I think it was the right decision because mm-hmm. that that meant I not only have built, um, made great work, but over the last decade, some of you, the people who I've worked with on that show, we are like, we're, we're it's like we went to war together because mm-hmm. it was so difficult. It was arduous. Um, Andrew, who's a tough boss, uh, and but if in you, what way? He's very demanding and has uh, a need for perfect- perfection and mm. requires a lot on the table. If you ever you get the chance to, and I'm sure you will eventually mm. get um, uh, a chance to interview some of his contemporaries um, who've worked with him, you get a better understanding. Uh, but he's so generous and kind. Um, and but you know, in a work in a work setting, it's uh, mm-hmm. it, he's got high standards and he he really wants the best is it the best in regards to production value story what is he what is it that he focuses he doesn't care so much about production value he cares about ideas Mm -hmm. um and he's really of the best idea wins kind of mantra and and executing that in a way that gets the idea across um and sometimes he would go and make us reshoot things to put on youtube like he'd say well we're going to put that to air but mm-hmm. you need to go and shoot a scene like this and a scene like this so when it goes on YouTube, it's better forever. And I would begrudgingly go, oh, fuck off. But <laughs> looking back, yeah. I don't resent that at all because he's absolutely correct. And the stuff that had been on, on the internet is is the legacy, really. And so it's it's one of those things where I go, fuck, you know, that is such a good lesson to learn. And I, I've kind of taken that with me with the teams that I've run like with Tonightly last year and and, uh, and smaller teams like Fusion in America and um, it kind of get get the teams I run to kind of think about that um, that kind of I know, concept as well. When there's teams and, and someone is sort of driving this energy that can sometimes be stressful or feel negative, how do you, as a team on the other side, process that? Like if you've got a hard boss... Yep. And you know that their intentions are great, but it also feels a certain way to you. How do you how do you how do you live in that space, or you know, be within that space? It's I leaned into it because I'd had television jobs in the past, and I'd I'd, I'd worked with people who were as demanding, but nowhere near as talented as Andrew. Mm-hmm. So yeah. it would be one of those things where uh, I would go. Yeah, tell me why I'm bad. Yeah, yeah. yeah. oh, I'm so bad. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Let's reshoot it. Yeah, you're right. It does need 15 more jokes. Yeah. Um, so Was I he would... your audience that like your audience rather than like would you think about him uh, more than the actual audience in regards to the, your filters? Um, no, I, I don't think so. But there would be times where I would come up. You know, Andrew is tough and, mm-hmm. and went in, in hungry based. He's a, he's a he's a teddy bear these days. Mm-hmm. But it's one of those things where, if you really fought for an idea, you could get it over the line if you fought hard enough. Um, but sometimes you would you you could lose that fight. So mm-hmm. that was that was doing. And at the end of the day, it would air and it wouldn't be as good. And you say you'd say, 
mate, we should have done it the way I wanted to do it. And he was like, yeah. oh, you didn't fight hard enough. And we're like, oh, well, fuck, next time I'm going to fucking dig my heels in and get it across the line the way I want to do it. So is it respect that you have for somebody that then allows you to, you're respecting their judgment even if it doesn't feel amazing? I, th- I think so. Um, only because it's a, it's a medium... It's a medium that they're very familiar with, and they've worked in for a long time. So I didn't, mi- I didn't, I didn't mind that. And also, they're much more successful. I've got no. I didn't, at the time, I had no real, mm. real runs on the board. Um, but now it's like, I, I, and, and and when you have outliers like Andrew, he's so smart and brilliant that you can't help but go, oh, well. You know, he's right. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> you know, it's just one of those things. So, you know, that was a real, it was a real privilege to work with Andrew and uh, Anita Jacoby um, brought a lot of the journalist sense to a lot of Hungry Beast and um, Andy Neal brought a lot of the fighting spirit. Andy Neal, um, for people who, people wouldn't know his name, but they definitely know all of his work. He, he, he was one of the producers of The Chaser um, and so many other shows um, and just a, a brilliant brain, particularly when it came to, um, getting things done um, and getting getting around getting around the legal processes but still playing within the law and um, and being able to combat the network like he was so mm-hmm. he was like a wonderful transistor uh, or a capacitor between us and the network so all the all the all the network notes would flow through him <laughs> and all the complaints from from ABC list, uh, viewers would go through him and he would reply to all of them and like not none of it would touch us so it was really it was really fascinating to see him work he'd just be maniacally laughing in his office at the next complaint that came through <laughs> so um yeah really really fascinating to see a, an incredible team that's built um that the, that hungry the way hungry beast is built and um, and all the people who I've come through with that show, the great thing after three seasons of that is that by the by the th- third season, you implicitly trust every single person on that team mm-hmm. and you kind of know their strengths and weaknesses. And not everyone made it to the third season. And so it's, it's one of those things where the team that you kind of end up with is this super strong um, team of champions mm. and now now look at the legacy of where all the people from Hungry Beast are yeah. it's incredible you know like there's you, you've got Walkley award winners you've got Palm Dior winners you've got Emmy award winners in mm. that team but um, also the people that that inspired as well I remember growing up and watching Hungry Beast and it was uh, completely different to anything that had been yeah. um, on air before. It, Even it the, felt new and exciting. Yeah. Well, I remember, like, as a technology geek, the motion graphics yeah, were yeah. one of those things that just you'd just sit and just be like, "How that?" You'd be stopping it midway and seeing the <laughs> infographics uh, from an, a pre-production point of view. How did you interface with that motion graphic stuff and working it into the ideas? So. A lot of that creative direction came from Patrick Clare, who was the motion graphics lead. And everybody wrote. Um, so Pat wrote, Luke wrote, another motion graphics guy. Duncan wrote, the other motion graphics guy. So everyone was kind of in charge of their own scripts and getting those skip scripts through to, through to production. And then other folks wrote um, stuff for them to do as well. So, and you'd sit down and you kind of, envisions what the idea might be and you take time to develop what it might be so in the second from the first and second season of hungry beast a lot of the the beast files as they became known as were extremely complex in the Mm -hmm. third season we made them a lot simpler (laughs) because they took they took uh, like two weeks to make they took a long time just rendering time back then (laughs) you know like it was crazy yeah um so the first season had extremely first and second season had extremely complex mm-hmm. um, graphics and then it kind of we kind of dumbed it down a bit just to make it a bit easier for the graphics yeah. guys because they were just being overworked did it change change lead times and what did it teach you about being able to communicate your idea to different types of departments um, I I'm a, like a I kind of I kind of love that stuff too mm-hmm. um, often Patrick is one of the extremely special motion graphics people who is a director in their own right and is a storyteller within the world of, which he knows, which is After Effects um, and 3D modeling. And you can go to him and say, look, this is the script. 
well, how do you, how do you think it will work? And it's a, becomes like a partnership. Like yeah. he'll be like, I reckon this could this this, and you're like, yeah, right. Can you do something like this? You'll be like, yeah, that's great. Mm-hmm. And then so you kind of build collaboratively mm-hmm. this idea. Um, often I would write a script and just chuck it to Pat and go, Pat, fix it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then you're talking to you know, this guy, Pat. Um, uh, I don't know if, you, if any of you have watched The Crown or Daredevil or True Detective mm-hmm. or anything like that. Ah. He do, he's done the opening titles of all those Amazing. shows. I remember hearing uh, True Detective that an Aussie guy did yeah. the opening yeah. set. He won an Emmy for Unbelievable. Yeah. So that's the Emmy Award winner. Yeah. Um, you said you haven't chased the money. You've done the things you love. You've, you've ventured overseas. You've worked in the US. Uh, I know there's been some, you know, stories that have been written about your times overseas where you may have lost a job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, Tommy and I talk, well, yeah, well, Tommy and I t- uh, talk about it because it's one of those things where it's like, specifically within this industry, it feels everyone's mm. jumping from place to place. You go from SCA to <laughs> ARN. You're doing all the yeah. jumping around. Well, you got. Well, I mean, yeah, everyone's. Because not every job lasts forever. Most you're not Dickie Wilkins. Not everyone yeah. gets thirty years at one company. Yeah, yeah. I'm so, doing another podcast straight after this. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to do two blo- blo- blokes talking tech straight after this. <laughs> and I got Tanya Hennessy out of this straight after that. And, oh man, so uh, you know. Yeah. But, so, uh, what was that experience? So you were paint the picture. What what happened? What went down? Uh, AJ Plus was just starting, and so that's Al Jazeera. Al Jazeera, yeah, yeah. Uh, out of San Francisco, and they had room to do. They, they kind of were extremely worthy after nine months of prepping they kind of went live and then I kind of got a job there as their senior satire person I remember the job interview um, I was just coming through the states and um, visiting and uh, I got in front of the the executive producer there and he, he's like and we just finished so Irrational Fear is my show mm-hmm. um, it's a podcast that I do and it's a satirical comedy podcast and we just spent a whole bunch of money making digital content online like we just spent 13 weeks of crowdfunded money um, with a great team of my friends and uh, and comedians just making digital content for 2014. And I was so close to getting it up on telly at the Comedy Channel. And um, and we went for uh, like our fifth meeting at the Comedy Channel. Like we thought, this is the one where they're going to commission. Like we've been, we've taken them to the Opera House. They've seen our show. We've they've watched our content. They love it. We're going back again. (laughs) We're going back with like the the second top guy at the Comedy Channel at Foxtel. And... um, he sat back and um, a half an hour meeting went for 45, turned into 90 minutes. And then at the end he went, look, I'll be honest with you. We've spent our money for the next couple of years. They commissioned this show called Open Slather where they spent $30 million making 15 episodes um, <laughs> of sketch comedy. Um, and it was aggravating because my budget was 1.5 for 13 episodes. So I was like, well, that's, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's a real kick in the balls. Yeah. Um, and so I was so despondent and sad about not getting that up. I really felt like a failure because I'd been driving Irrational Fear so hard. Why did you want TV or why did you think TV was the plan for that? Because it's unsusta- like unsustainable to do what I wanted to do at scale. Yeah. So, uh-huh. um, Do you think it's changed? In 2019, if you're on the same path, I guess you'd go to streaming services or... You know, what- well, I am on the same path. So yeah. I'm looking for... I'm looking for... Um, uh, I'm looking to buy a house in Sydney, mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> feed my family yeah. and make comedy. Yeah. And it's hard to do without the kind of money that um, television can provide or, or a streaming service or a network mm-hmm. can provide. I mean, when you're trying to buy Russell Crowe's next door oh, <laughs> uh, neighbours. Yeah. Expensive taste. I, had a, I don't know if I should tell this story, but a good friend of mine rented an apartment um, in this building where a famous person passed away mm. and he got it extremely cheap and I was like don't you even don't you even care that this person died he's like yeah. nah <laughs> look, at, look at the views and I'm like oh okay mate <laughs> alright um, I, anyway. I sort of get that people die all over the place get a bargain yeah. Yeah. a bargain's a bargain the whole yeah. world's a bloody cemetery yeah, yeah people die everywhere yeah. it's a uh, good outlook it's a good outlook yeah. <laughs> if I can leave you one thing the whole world's a cemetery <laughs> so you, you weren't feeling too good after so the yeah then I you know I went to then I went to America and um, and I was so stoked to kind of yeah. be accepted at America and I pitched I pit, kind of pitched Al Jazeera comedy which is very funny in itself and the is guy, there a context change that you have to do in regards to like is oh they love Aussies so I've got to play like I've got to change this part of my personality I spent or? a lot of time in America so I don't really yeah. I kind of I kind of 
I used to think that the first time I went like 20 years and ago. And you but got now, rid of like, the eco hat. Yeah, I got, <laughs> I got rid of it. Yeah, you, don't, you just don't need it. You just don't need it. Like it, it, there's people from all over the world there. So the guy I was yeah. pitching to was Syrian. Yeah. Um, and he's like, okay, dude, well, you know, how do you make Israel and Palestine funny? And I'm like, um, uh, and I pulled up this sketch, which we yeah. did three weeks before at Splendor, where we interviewed <laughs> drunk kids at Splendor about how to fix Israel and Palestine yeah. and uh, it was all Vox Pops and it was all done with motion graphics uh, not done by Pat Clare but done by another brilliant artist um, Alex Gabbett and it was just the most hilarious Vox Pop with people off their face at Splendor yeah. trying to fix Israel and Palestine and, it was, and he's like okay that's funny man you got the job and I'm like sweet <laughs> Um, so then I moved over at the beginning of that year and I spent five months working for Al Jazeera making um, satire for them. And it was one of those things where they would just throw stuff at me and going, hey, this journalist can't go to um, media day at the Super Bowl. Can you go? Yeah. And I'm like, uh, sure. Yeah. I don't know anything about <laughs> anything about the Super Bowl. So I quickly looked up the baddest things about Super Bowl and kind yeah. of went and made, um, tried to make comedy there. Then, then like, I'll get thrown to CPAC, the uh, the the Conservative Political, Political Action Committee, a conference in, in, in Maryland um, where I would go and interview people about about um, Muslims in America or I would try and bring, I would try and create a holy war, get people to sign up to the holy war uh, against Muslims, which was funny in itself. And I saw I saw Donald Trump speak um, and he would have been about this far away from me wow. at the time. Wow. So that's 2014 um, or? That was 2015. 2015. Yeah. yeah. And he would, he would sit in the room and he would go, you know, I'm not gonna, I don't know if I'm going to run. I don't, I don't know. And people go, well, run, run. I don't know. Should I run? Yeah, run, run, run. <laughs> so funny. And so I, I, I had to quickly learn. I had to quickly learn about the, the struggle for me was understanding American politics. At the time, mm. I had some idea. But that six months, I was thrust in it and I had to learn real quick. Because mm. the people that were working there were so much smarter than me, um, had a much broader understanding of um, geopolitical um, machinations and local machinations. So I had to learn real quick. So in that five months, I kind of, it was like a real baptism of fire. So I got there. And then um, I just got an American agent and he's like, oh, oh uh, you know, the Daily Show are going to be looking for new, <laughs> new people. And I was like, awesome, I'm yeah, in. Yeah. So I wrote a couple of scripts and recorded them on the green screen at work and edited them and sent them off. And then someone saw me do that. So my producer mm -hmm. so helped me do it. She kind of, she had her nose out of place and was like, well, you know, Dan's doing this. And then mm. somebody else went, what do you mean, what do you mean Dan's doing that? So on, you know, and that person called someone in Qatar, in Doha, and then apparently the Prince of Doha sacked me. So, so oh, it's, it's, it's a it's, good story. Yeah. Yeah. It came but like, you know, it's like in a big media organization, you've got edit suites where journalists are like constantly updating their show reels to get a job somewhere else. Yeah. Or exactly. So is that a cultural, like, is that a, uh, them not understanding how the, the industry works? Were they, or do you think, were they so committed to you? that they were upset that you were oh. potentially turning your back on them? Well, I don't think... Um, I think my boss had my back. My, mm -hmm. my uh, bosses had my back, which is great. But then this person who was in the office was visiting from um, Qatar. Uh -huh. They didn't like what I did. So yeah. they went above... They went above my bosses yeah. and got me fired while I was on holiday with my um, girlfriend in Manila. So I landed and then got fired. <laughs> and so what was that? What was that experience like? Oh, it was horrific. My whole world just flipped upside down. I'd moved to America. My girlfriend and I. How much, How long in were you? Only five months. Yeah. So I like a, rented a house. Uh -huh. Blah blah blah. So then I had to pack up all my shit and go home. And um, so I did that. And um, and then six months later, did uh, you fight? Fight it? Did no, you? I couldn't, I couldn't. I couldn't fight. It. Yeah. I couldn't fight it because it was came it came from came from Doha. Yeah. Um, yeah. Wow. Yeah, Do you so, think, what's the? You know, I just thought a, that was that's the moment. That's like a sliding doors moment for me, where I'm like, fuck. If I played that differently, um, I I don't know if I could have been on, yeah. on the Daily Show, but you know maybe something else would have happened. But it was just funny, and I kept it on my hat for a few mm. weeks, and then um, Ali Petrowski from from a current affair was visiting San Francisco, and we went out to dinner, and she posted Instagram, and then pedestrian ran it. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, wow. I mean, you, how do you get another job then if you can't sort of, 
do it within the time. I mean, using the equipment, I see. I see where they. Did are you go from. back to the office, or that was it? Like, yeah, Out the door. like what's no, the... I just packed up my stuff and left, and that was it. Yeah. It's a real scene out of an American movie. Yeah, yeah, isn't it is. It? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, I think that you're someone that's um, thirsty for opportunities or someone that, like, you just look at everything that you've done and you've done so many things and you could look at that example. I'm hearing needy. You're absolutely <laughs> right. <laughs> need no, attention. No, no, but no, I think it's like um, you're extremely hard, hard working and it's one of those things where it's like I've – followed along like i went to um massage my medium did you the, yeah in oh melbourne my god what and year was so that josh that would have been uh must have been 2010 or 2009 no, no, that was, that was 2008 oh uh, no 2009 yeah. so mark Fennell and i did massage my, so we did mm. beakersfield the musical for mm. the first three weeks of comedy festival then the last week um we did massage my medium and every <laughs> night we had a special guest and it was like mark Fennell and i doing a show about like a young person's media watch mm. we were kind of deconstructing media in Australia and like where it might be heading and, and how and like how fucking Australian media was so backward and how yeah. the internet was going to revolutionise everything because yeah. <laughs> I just had no idea as a young person in like went to a low socioeconomic school like didn't like had an okay education but there was just so many massive gaps in, in my knowledge I felt that like this was my um, I didn't go to uni or whatever and this was learning from all the content that you were doing um yeah i i can i can see how i've seen your career and i've seen how, my point being the the opportunities and this the amount of stuff that you've done is is incredible um would you looking at the le- looking at that lens looking at that opportunity lens yeah with the um the daily show stuff mm. what what other option like what how could you have done it differently I, I I don't think I could have done it too differently. Maybe mm. I couldn't have. Maybe I sh- couldn't have filmed. Maybe I just filmed it on my camera at home. Mm. You know, mm. that was the, the that was the other opportunity, which uh, which other people would have done. Mm. Um, but when I was home in my parents' house back in Sydney, and the news came out that Ronnie got the job, mm. it made me feel so good. Yeah, I was just like, oh, that mm. is incredible. <laughs> Ronnie is the best. He's, He's a friend of yours. Yeah, yeah. Ronnie's like lovely bloke, and it's just like, ah. Oh, and he's talented and killing it and it's like I'm so happy for him yeah. and so I was like it kind of made me it kind of clo- it brought closure to that mm-hmm. you know I was just like Ronnie's heaps better than me <laughs> mm-hmm. and I was like yeah I'll just bring that bring that to a close and um, it felt really good and I was just so stoked for him so uh, and then so then I kind of had a few more tilts at the US and, and now, now I'm back here yeah. do you think the uh, the American people are more Political than Australians, uh, yeah. I, I think some are. I think some. It depends on the wealth gap. I think. I think if you're slightly, if you are rich enough, you don't have to worry about healthcare. Um, you are, might be less engaged, and yeah. those people generally don't vote. Um, and if you're, uh, and I feel like there's a lot of folks there who have to think about. The politics every day in America is politics, mm. um, particularly if you're a person of color. It is uh, in Australia, it's the same too. But there, it's so, it feels like so much more pronounced, and everything. Mm. Everyone's a little bit more on edge. And there wasn't a day when I was at Fusion in, in LA for two years. I worked there where I didn't talk about healthcare. Mm-hmm. It was one of the like in the office. There was enough people to talk about going to the doctor or something. What a pain in the ass it was that it was a weird conversation to my ears to have all the time um, because in Australia we don't have to worry so much about that mm. but there it's at the top of people's minds it's this underlying anxiety about how much healthcare costs which doctor you can go to how you can go to the doctor quickly within a work hours that's near you within the network that you are paying for and all this stuff so super super low level anxiety mm. about very basic needs that underlines everything in America. It's all to do with politics. You could imagine what that does to a human, just yeah. living in a world where they have to think about these things. Well, it seems like one of those like obvious needs, like primary yeah. needs or whatever. And Hum- so, human well, needs. Yeah. Yeah. It's like it's so bizarre. Like, and, and guns is another thing, but mm-hmm. less less problematic in LA. But uh, 
but it's one of those things where, well, if Republicans don't want gun control, maybe they should be for universal health care so that when yeah. people do get shot, they can get fixed for free. Yeah. So, you, you did a bunch of like on the ground work. I remember seeing stuff that was you shooting it very solo. The difference between the hungry beast experience of being in a team and collaborating versus the difference between you with a backpack and a camera. What do you prefer? Uh, in a team, I'm very collaborative, mm -hmm. yeah, and I don't often don't trust my own judgment, so I like other people there to tell me um, to do it better. Yeah, <laughs> this is one of the things that I was kind of with the Al Jazeera experience was great, but there wasn't the at the time they hadn't, and they, I was like one of the more senior people there, mm -hmm. so I had to kind of really rely on my own judgment, yeah, and I really didn't trust myself, and I really wanted to learn. I was really looking for an opportunity to learn more than I already knew um, in terms of comedy and comedy creating. And at the, at the point I was there, I was like, oh, I see, I'm running this whole thing myself. <laughs> so it's very strange. And likewise with Fusion, I thought I'd be running a team of a few, of like 10, 15 people mm -hmm. to make stuff every day. But when I got there, it was a team of two. Yeah. I was like, oh, okay, right. Uh, it's a fancy title I've got, but I'm done, <laughs> yeah, but uh, <laughs> I've only got two people to do things with. All right, well, let's... Uh, Let's give it a go. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I prefer a larger teams to kind of make great stuff. That's when I came home yeah. and started working on Tonightly. Um, it was a real thrill to kind of run a team of 40. I was like, mm -hmm. wow, what mm -hmm. a cool experience, like, uh, to go run a team from a team of two to running a team of 40 really far, fast, smart, uh, fast, smart, funny people who can turn things around every day. That what was have, amazing. What have you found? Uh, teams that are smaller can get more done or does a bigger team mean you can get lots more done? Oh, bigger team means you can get lots more done, but uh, Tonightly was separated into small teams and the small teams could turn things around very quickly. Um, you can write, produce... Um, shoot and edit a sketch all in one day. Um, the way that, that the way Tonightly was set up, um, kind of in four separate field teams. So that was pretty thrilling to kind of see that in action and um, watch that flywheel effect go through. And um, when I kind of took over, I kind of just all I did was kind of step out of people's way and let them kind of develop their own sense and kind mm. of patch things up as they went along. Um, and so it was really. A really cool experience. Yeah. Mm. Uh, so yeah, small smaller teams can get things done pretty quickly, um, and what we were doing on tonightly was just phenomenal <laughs> with how much content we were making. Well, every it makes day. sense. Teams within teams. It's you teams know, within teams. Yeah. yeah. So this our little operation, th the three of us, is sometimes more than what I did when I worked in the big stations with <laughs> ten people in the yeah. show. You well, know, we're super focused, and everyone. I think it's that. Uh, because we're doing it every single day, similar to what you were talking about with the mm. Hungry Bee stuff, we've sort of radically had to work out what we're good at, what we're not good at, and then yeah. pick up the pieces. And also, like, it's a, you know, it's a, this kind of stuff, which you do every day, is a muscle. Mm. So, and you're working this out every day, and by, I'm sure by your 50th episode, you're like, yeah. oh, right, well, let's fucking do another one. Yeah, yeah, look yeah, at you know. the body on Mr. 97. Yeah, muscle. look at him. <laughs> just ripped and rock hard. And he doesn't even go to the gym. It's just this. Uh, talking small teams, I was watching old videos that you did with Brad Blanks oh, yeah. uh, uh, in the US. What I love about Brad and also your content is the adv the sense of adventure and just the fish out of out of water stuff. What was it like working together? So Brad and I met at the 2002 Olympics in Salt Lake City. And this was a guy who was like hooked on radio. His story is phenomenal. And, yeah. you know, I know you've interviewed him, yeah. but like going from the Sydney Olympics, reporting for WPLJ, and then two years later, I met him in Salt Lake City, like pretty much at the beginning of his, of his radio kind of journey in yeah. America. And he was just like, oh, Dan, I got this interview with this gymnast. Oh, fuck, I got it. It was so good. <laughs> And, um, Did he do the cough? Yeah, that as well? cough seemed like it was part of the whole. Yeah. yeah, and we were Impression. we were going to parties. Like Brad knew where all the parties were. He was so connected. And then in the Athens Olympics, uh, we got we got even tighter because Brad got got us all into the Sports Illustrated parties every week, and there was just chock full of celebrities, which is fodder for him because of his radio yeah. show, and it was just phenomenal those early days with Brad, and then then we started making content together so we kind of at the time i got back from the olympics and was mucking around with um 
uh, Ronnie John's on Channel 10 and then I started working at Fairfax after Channel 10 making video content for them and then I kind of pitched video content to, to Fairfax Digital back in the day um, this is when you know SMH had money to make videos yeah. I was like so I've got this mate Brad in America uh, I reckon we can make a little series out of him and I'll, I'll, I'll roam around with him and, and go to these big events like Sundance and um, at the SAG Awards and and the Super Bowl and um, and it's, you know it's an Aussie a country Aussie bloke in New York City um, trying to make, meet celebrities and, yeah. and check out America and they're like great go do it and I kind of um, how much did they give you yeah well, how'd that? you work out the budget tiny amount like uh, uh, like five grand mm -hmm. and so I I enough to for me to buy a ticket and borrow a camera and spend some time over there and then do Brad you think you under like because i noticed over the years i've undersold myself based on this is a fucking great idea if i if i get this across a line it's a win like yeah. at the time i was like 2008 i was like 27 uh -huh. and i just thought this would be the best fun ever and i didn't think about you know how much money i need to live over there <laughs> yeah. and at the time i was video editing so i was making lots of money being a video editor on stupid hourly rate to make terrible corporate videos so I had lots of money saved up and I was just like well how about how would you like these videos do you have 5,000 yeah. great let's go make it uh, and that was great and then later on I did another series for Fairfax where I got 2,500 from Fairfax and 2,500 from a, a company called heavy.com and made content as a co-pro with them um, and so Brad and I would just travel around and do these zany videos uh, and Brad was always bad at being structured so what I kind of brought to him was a little sense of like storytelling and structure for those videos so I was like okay Brad this is where we've got to set this up yeah, set a solution let's go through tell me what you're thinking tell me what you're thinking tell me what you're thinking maybe say it like this in a bit of a funnier way and he's like yeah great god this is great Dan this is great <laughs> so yeah we, would, yeah we would just like we, we became brothers and it was um, uh, Brad's one of my best mates and it was a just making crazy content with him all over all over the place and one of those clips we did at Sundance mm -hmm. and it was great. We were making these Fox Pop videos with, with people on the red carpet and, and it was all crammed into like three weeks. So SAG Awards, the adult video, the porn awards, the uh, <laughs> Super Bowl and Sundance uh, were all kind of in the space of two weeks. And then Brad would fly us all, all around the country to, to get to film it. And we were at Sundance and we we're at this party like at two o'clock in the morning and um, I had... It was the party for the Wackness. And Mary Kate Olsen was in it. Mm -hmm. And um, and I, years before, six years before, was a ski locker room attendant at the Deer, at the Stein Erickson Lodge where I put her boots on her feet uh, <laughs> and in, in Utah. And I was like, oh, Mary Kate, remember me? Dan from the locker room. <laughs> She's like, no, go away. And I was like, okay, all right, fine. So... And Brad and I were talking to these stockbrokers who financed another film at Sundance and they know Brad because Brad's like a celebrity in, in radio circles in New York and they're like hey Brad how are you getting home tomorrow and Brad's like oh I've got to interview Matthew Perry tomorrow so you know we're going to get the red eye red yeah. eye home tomorrow and they're like hey don't get the red eye come home with us we got a corporate jet yeah we got space come on it'd be great it's like no 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 you gotta interview Matthew Perry in the morning yeah. and, uh, and uh, we're like, Brad and I are walking through the snow home and um, to our apartment, and, uh, and I was like, Brad, what are you, what are you doing? Like, <laughs> you're going to interview Matthew Perry ten years after Friends is finished, or you get to fly home from Sundance in a corporate jet? <laughs> He's like, Oh, you're fucking right, Dad. You're fucking right. <laughs> he whipped out his BlackBerry at the time and called, called the. Uh, no, he still has that. We saw him last year. <laughs> <in New York. laughs> and he called, he called Dave, the chief, and he's like, Chief, Chief, do you have two seats? Great. We'll see you there. 7 a.m. All right, great, bye. It's like 3 a.m. So we sleep for a couple of hours, get the taxi down to Salt Lake. And uh, we're waiting. It's Flying corporate is amazing. Like there's no lines, there's mm. no tickets, there's no there's no nothing. Yeah. It's like you turn up and you get on the plane and you leave. You need your passport? Uh, well, not not internally. Yeah, no, yeah. Not inter not, it's yeah, like, uh, Tommy's never flown before. <laughs> <laughs> it's, like catching, it's like catching an Uber. It's like, uh, in America though. Uh, or you even, have to show ID. You show some form of ID. I can't even remember doing that because yeah. we just turned up. Dave, the stockbroker, turned up. He's like, "Come on, boys, let's go." Yeah. So we hop mm. on the plane. But as we're waiting there, Brad's like starving, 
Uh-huh. And he's there's like a vending machine with noodles, and he so he gets some noodles. He's sitting there eating <laughs> eating his noodles. And he's like, oh, just so starving. Oh yeah, this is great. And Dave walks in. He's like, Brad, what are you doing? We've got food on the plane. <laughs> he's like, oh fuck, you're right, you're right, yeah, fuck, you're right. So we hop on the plane, and uh, we're, we're we're flying, and and Dave's like. Uh, so, you know, treat yourself. We got magazines, DVDs, you know, whatever. Cheryl will cook you something, whatever you want, blah, blah, blah. There's drinks. Just, you know, have a good time. And um, and then the guy, there was a, there's a guy called Jackie the Joke Man um, from yeah, Howard from, Stern. Yeah, yeah. Howard Stern show. He was on the plane too. Uh, and he's like, why would you, why would you want to watch a DVD when you can listen to an old man regale you of Radio <laughs> Past? <laughs> so then he was just telling stories about cocaine and strippers and Howard Stern and... Because he probably would like he was off Howard Stern at that point. He was off. Yeah, yeah. he's so, got an email list you can yeah. subscribe to. He <laughs> sent you lists of terrible jokes every day, uh, and that was amazing. And we we're like, "Fuck, Jackie the Joke Man just got these incredible stories." And he then he falls asleep. So <laughs> then, then we landed. We land in New Jersey, and um, and we're like all trying to organize a taxi. And Dave's like, "Don't worry, we got you. We got your car. You know, we got your car. You just hop in and go to your go to your home." So Brad at the time was living in Hotel Pennsylvania, and. Uh, in he he kind of goes downgraded over the years the first time i visited him was would have been 2002 and he was in the presidential suite yeah. at the hotel pennsylvania because the hotel pennsylvania was a sponsor of wplj radio station those sponsors he talks about the oh at t deals that he had like so crazy it's amazing. So he was in like this the, the <laughs> biggest suite in the hotel pennsylvania because they looked after him. that was yeah. the, that was part of his deal yeah and then but by 2008, he was in the shittiest little room. <laughs> but still, at the Hotel Wets yeah. And so we're there a day early. We didn't expect to be there. We thought we'd be there the next day. And so we're trying to figure out what other content we can do when Good Day USA mm-hmm. was happening. And it was happening up at the Lincoln Center. Um, and Brad lived down at uh, Madison Square Garden, so Midtown. So we are going to have a shower, put mm-hmm. on our suits and head uptown to go and interview Aussie celebrities at Good Day USA. We knew John Travolta and other people were going to be there too. And then I'm in the shower. And I hear Brad in the bedroom going, What? Oh, fuck. No. Fuck. Fuck. Shit. All right, fuck. Fuck. Thanks, mate. He's like, Dan, Heath Ledger's dead. I was like, wow, fuck. So we're trying to figure out what we're going to do. Um, we hop in a cab. We Where just, was Heath Ledger at the time? He was so, in New York City. Uh-huh. He was in uh, Greenwich Village. Mm-hmm. Uh, he ju- it was just after Batman. Mm-hmm. Uh, and... We didn't know where he lived in Greenwich Village. We just knew he lived in Greenwich Village. Uh-huh. Um, so that guy on the phone was a guy who at the time was uh, just finishing having sex with the chief of staff of the New York Post, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Zozzy Blake. And so he, the first person he called yeah. after, after he overheard a conversation uh, uh, with this girl was Brad. Mm-hmm. And so just by fluke we found this out and we're right so we're racing down to Greenwich Village and it's about eight o'clock in the morning Australia time so I start or Sydney time so I start calling Sydney Morning Herald and I was mm-hmm. like explaining what we've found and mm-hmm. how we're just going to go down and check it out and see if, see if we can find anything else out um, and and running around Greenwich Village trying to find um, mm. Heath's house and I, was, I knew there was a couple of Aussie bars down there knocking on their doors at this time it was probably about 5 o'clock in the afternoon how are you trying to reflect it what are you thinking about like is it someone down the street that saw him the day before or what What are you what are you looking for in that moment uh, yeah we're, I, we're just I'm just looking for answers mm-hmm. that's it trying to find mm. any clues yeah. I have no idea where he lives yeah, yeah. we just know he lives in the village mm-hmm. And so there's Aussie bars down there. I went to Eight Mile Creek and asked them. There's another Aussie cafe. I asked them, couldn't find it. Then I saw a news van go around the corner. I was like, oh, maybe I'll just follow that news van. So I'm like running after this news van. It was an ABC news van. Mm. And the news van parked right out the front of a house with cops out the front. Mm. I was like, well, this could be, this could mm. be it. So I just start filming. And then I call Brad and tell him where we are, where I am. He comes down and joins me. And... Um, and then we start filming. We kind of just kind of we didn't. I don't know what the hell I was doing. I wasn't really a journalist back then. I was. A, mm. What a sort of camera were you using? Like a so, PD one seventy or something? Or? So well, I had hired or borrowed a very expensive Sony HDV camera mm. from my mate Brendan Smith, who's a camo at Channel Z1 Seven. Z one or something. Mm. Z one. Mm. That's yeah. it. Yeah. Nice. But on the plane to Vegas, it had smashed and broke. Oh no! Uh, oh no! Uh, in in uh, when we checked it in so we were using brad's shitty one chip <laughs> canon yeah. um 
Canon camera, mm -hmm. uh, shooting on mini DV. And Brad came and met me. We kind of were just getting B-roll of stuff. Didn't, no one was really speaking. There was no other journalist there. There was an AP photographer, the ABC News van. The AP photographer took a photo of me at the front of Heath's house. And that photo is on the City Morning Herald article about Heath Ledger's death. Oh, wow. And in the front, you see me in my backpack filming the oh, house. Wow. Mm. And so Brad turns up and I say, Brad, can you just hang here with the camera? Um, I take out my laptop. I firewire the footage from my camera to my laptop, give the camera to Brad and you say, so I said to Brad, you just keep filming, get mm. what you can. I'm going to be at the Starbucks two blocks away. So yeah. I, I run to the Starbucks and upload the footage to my FTP. Yeah, <laughs> my FTP server. You're uh, talking Mr. 97 language. Yeah. 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 FTP uh, it's a file transfer protocol <laughs> uh, server. You use a, it's sort of like a web server. That, it's like Dropbox, but you own it. Um, um, and so, and I call Fairfax and say, look, this is what we, this is what we know. This is yeah. where we're at. Um, uh, we'll have more information. So they're, they're downloading the footage. And because I would alerted to them what had happened, they started writing the story. And by the time... Um, they were ready to hit publish on the story. They just needed confirmation. Mm -hmm. uh, Brad came in the Starbucks and he's like, Dan, I got it. I got it. So he'd, while, while I was uploading my B-roll, he got confirmation from a cop about what had happened. And I quickly jammed the camera into my laptop at that Starbucks and downloaded the footage and uploaded the cop conversation over the Starbucks Wi-Fi. And Fairfax got it, ripped it, turned it into video, confirmed the story. They were the first to break it. Um, in the world, I think Perez Hilton beaten by like ten minutes or something. But like they were the first news organization mm. to to break it because back then Twitter really wasn't yeah. a thing. It was mm. it was new. Uh, and then we ran up town to interview uh, the Aussie celebrities on the red carpet, and they had found out at that point. And so we we were I we interviewed all these Aussie celebrities, ran downstairs to the Starbucks underneath them, mm. downloaded the footage, and uploaded the footage to. Um, to Fairfax and so we kind of broke we kind of were the first to kind of break this story it was like kind of this confluence of digital digital storytelling kind of meets journalism in a, in a real really tangible way it was and that was the first time I really really kind of was a journal was a journalist rather yeah. than a comedian and it it really was super interesting um, time and it, you had a certain rush it was a very sad story but at the same mm. time for me it's it's at the time, it was extremely um, sad to say this. It was, it was, it was thrilling to kind of mm. be in that space. Uh, well, I guess that's why there is CNN. There's there's 24 hour mm. news because yeah. there is, it is an entertain like it is a form of entertainment for many people. Yeah, but you know, but we were also trying to break it first and break it right. And yeah, all that stuff, and it was it was a really strange experience to be in in a taxi talking to editors at the Sydney yeah. Morning Herald and, and uploading footage and all over the places like before there was 4G or 5 yeah. or any kind of wireless internet. Were you thinking about how do I, we do this tastefully? Like when you Coming are... Coming from the jet? Yeah. Okay. Well, <laughs> yeah, we were just... just trying, well, I mean, that was, that was one thing like the, one of the editors at the Sydney Morning Herald was like, and Dan, um, someone said that uh, Mary-Kate Olsen was with him at the time because he was allegedly dating him. Yeah. I said, no, that's not true. I was with Mary-Kate last night uh, at the Sundance <laughs> Film Festival. So that was absolutely not true. <laughs> oh, I remember that though. People were saying that she yeah. was in the apartment or... Or and uh, been there. so I got to I got to debunk that that was yeah. uh, because I I was with Mary Kate that night. Yeah, <laughs> and so what's Not the Heath Ledger. <laughs> what's the experience like the news thing? Like, because there's people who do have a whole career chasing that and doing it was, that. It was like really funny. There was a the, the, the US correspondent for the Australian was there, and um and I didn't meet any of the local Fairfax people because I was just a, I was just an idiot. Mm. Um and and Brad overheard them. He said, Oh Dan. That's the Australian guy. That's the News Corp guy there, and he's really pissed off. Oh, he, he said, "He said this fucking cunt got it foot before us." <laughs> <laughs> I was like, "I mean, they're totally desensitised. You guys had come from like a, you know, outer space and had a like, lead yeah. and followed it, and you know, treated it like you did. But their job is to be pretty black and blue. Just yeah. this story, go, get it, yeah, get it out, done, go home. And it's a, it was a, it was a big story, and um." Uh, I think for, for me, it was no skin, like I had no skin in the game as to whether we broke it or whatever. Mm. But for him and the other journos there that were from Australia, now, oh, it's, 
they had didn't have they didn't have skin in the game. Yeah. They would have probably been raked over the coals for not getting it first. It's an interesting case study in that the new media and that uh, different way of doing things. I feel like at that mm. time, citizen journalism was just becoming that sort of big thing of people being able to use you know yep. their devices to capture that stuff. Yeah, indie media websites and stuff mm. like that. That was kind of a big thing back then, yeah. and, and uh, it was still all new. It was still all new. Fairfax issued journalists with awful smartphones that could record video back mm. before the iPhone was yeah. um, was really a thing and things like that as well. So, yeah. It was what is your thoughts on sort of the shallow media or that the media that's just doing stuff on on the surface versus the that sort of more feature content where they're going in and really reporting on something for a long time? portion of time what do you mean so i guess with twitter and those those sort of um being able to be quick to a story versus giving the detail of a story i think you've got to be i think you have to be if it comes to the battle between quick and right i think you Mm -hmm. want to be right Mm -hmm. um and you want to make sure the story is correct before it goes out Mm -hmm. um because it that's what you do as a journalist you want to you want the truth um so if I was early on filing fast or filing smart, I'd file smart mm-hmm. um, and make sure you have all your ducks in a row. So, yeah, that's that's kind of what I think. Yeah. Uh, and then you, I think you need a mix of both. I think you need breaking stories um, in bite-sized chunks and then you can, with hindsight, you can look at a bigger picture with something a bit more in-depth. And I think both, both things have a place. Spending so much time in the US, how does it change your perspective of Australia? Generally, I think we're doing some really good things, um, but I think the media market here is six years behind. Mm-hmm. Uh, Why seeing, is that? I mean, we're pretty far away from the states. I Technology think, too. I think scale scale of audience is a big thing. So we're all battling for a small audience mm-hmm. in Australia, and I think I think there's a, a reluctance to experiment with new forms when it comes to digital storytelling or, or digital products. Um, there's no reason why in Australia we don't have a uh, in my mind, there's no reason why we shouldn't have a great Vox style mm. broadcaster mm. or publisher in Australia. Um, we've got some experiments going. Junkies doing moving into that space, which is great. Pedestrian are moving into the pop culture version of that space, and um, they've got money from platforms like Facebook to make video content. So you might see more of that from from Junkie, uh, but there's no one doing. There's no, I don't think there's anyone doing it in a more serious fashion, mm-hmm. in a more scalable fashion. So it's it's hard. It's really hard in Australia to kind of make that make that work because we just don't have the audience to get the money from a brand or advertiser. Mm-hmm. Right, right now, brands are still pummeling so much money into television, yeah. um, and but the audience is disproportionately not there. So the audience isn't in television, but brands are still piling so much money into it. The, the audience has shifted online in a major way. The only people that are watching television are boomers, mm-hmm. and bless them, they watch stuff, which is great. Um, but young people, anyone under forty, n- doesn't watch television as much yeah. or at what, all. What's your favourite medium? Um, I really like the xylophone. I think that's really, <laughs> really get some good timbre. Could um, you break a, a big story? <laughs> with yeah, a Morse, Morse code. code. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds <laughs> great too. <laughs> it's my favourite medium. Uh, then followed by paper mache. I think it's a really, really and good medium. And then smoke signals. <laughs> yeah, yeah, good medium. Uh, I love, I love podcasts and I love radio. Mm. Um, I've hosted a lot of ABC radio in Sydney and that was that right like hosting breakfast in Sydney was one of the highlights of my patchy mm. career because you feel like you're you're driving the city you yeah, know yeah. like you're in charge of the city for the what day years, when were you doing that to the 2014 uh-huh. so before I went to the states I was filling in a lot on 702 mm-hmm. all the shifts um, and when I filled in for breakfast over summer it was just great mm-hmm. just great fun and I so loved getting up at like 4 a.m. and <laughs> And doing that, that shift. It was really fun. <laughs> you actually enjoyed getting up that early. I loved it. Because we got up early the other day, and I was thinking about our f- friend uh, Jace Hawkins, who does uh, breakfast mm. in Melbourne, and just thinking about 
oh, that's his every every day, <laughs> which I think would be pretty intense. Even Ben Fordham, probably 3.30 has to get yeah. up to go to the Today Show. Can I say, Ben, it's great to see you move the Nutribullet to the office <laughs> so Jody doesn't have to listen to your fucking smoothie making at 4 a.m., you selfish cunt. <laughs> so if there's one thing you, you could do, it's like you can only pick one, the, the medium, is it audio, is it video, is it written? Um, I think... I think audio is pretty special. Like what you what you guys are doing now is really special. You're building an audience from from what you're doing, and I'm sure your audience is very appreciative. And they join you um, because they think you're. It's very intimate. You know, mm. you're you're talking directly to your audience, and you're building a friendship and a relationship with that audience, and that's really special. Um, and I think you can build good audiences with audio, and that's why I do the podcast. That's why I do a rational fear, um, which is a great vehicle for not only for comedians but for to have real discussions mm. uh, about not only for comedy but to have real discussions about real issues in the world so i kind of enjoying i've been enjoying building that up like our audience has grown 10 times this year since we've started it back up again amazing um which is really cool and we've toured all around australia with it and people turn up which is great we just did a mm. show in canberra um a couple of weeks ago and it was like this full show filled with people filled with people who wanted to hear a rational fear and I was like wow this is so good and yeah. they were so loud I think in Canberra because they're so thirsty for entertainment <laughs> um, but, uh, the entertainment capital yeah. <laughs> but it was such a thrill to kind of go there and, and be um, appreciated by the audience so um, yeah I think audio is really is, is really a great vehicle and it, at the moment and people people joke about how there's so many podcasts and everyone's got a podcast, mm -hmm. but the listening isn't anywhere comparable to radio. Mm -hmm. And there's such an opportunity there to kind of move those listeners over oh, definitely. to podcasts in a, in a major way. Hey, can you tell us about this Audible deal that you've just done? Oh, yes. Yeah. So for the last year, Mark Humphreys, Evan Williams and Casey Anning and I have written a show, uh, a, a, a audio sitcom for Audible. And... It's roughly the Breaking Bad of a conservative commentator. <laughs> it's a, a, a late night, irrelevant commentator who records his show at midnight, all of a sudden gets thrust into the breakfast slot and learns how to be racist and becomes really popular and, um, <laughs> and then starts, a, has, starts an event um, which sees him having to go into exile overseas. Um, and uh, I'll just say that. Oh, no, no, no. So he's in exile overseas, and then he ends up having to. He ends up. <laughs> saying it sounds so dumb. He ends up going scuba diving, and the boat disappears, and he ends up having to come back to Australia by an asylum seeker boat. Um, <laughs> there's more. There's more to that story, but uh, it's eight part, half hours, and we're doing a final joke pass this week on the scripts, and they are so funny, and I'm really proud of it, and I can't wait to get a production at, at the end of this month. What's what surprised you about dealing with Audible versus, say, the traditional networks, or is it the same? Audible have been uh, hands off to a large degree. They've had notes when it comes to legal and um, cultural things, mm -hmm. so all of our scripts went off to the UK to be edited, and the UK guy um, and I were really good for the most part and then mm -hmm. it comes to stuff like references in the script to wogs mm -hmm. uh, as someone who's lebanese and serbian i identify as a wog yeah. so it's totally fine for me yeah. to do that and he's like oh you can't say that that's as bad as the n-word here i'm like what are you talking about and i like send him like wogs out of work yeah. super wog all these all these australian <laughs> cultural icons boy, send well, the boy. Boy. Yeah. i was like here's what's happening in australia right yeah. and he's like i can't believe you people are doing this and i'm like yeah this is how it works and uh, we had a joke we had a, a fake sponsor in the in the in the fake show. Sponsor. We had this fake ad, and it was like, um, uh, "Such and such show is sponsored by Coon Cheese. It's a family name. Get over it." Like, <laughs> and he's like, "You definitely can't have that. You can't. Why be racist for the sake of being racist?" Yeah. I'm like. It's the name of a cheese. Yeah. It's the name of a cheese in Australia. I've like, seen him coon ads and he's like, I can't believe you didn't. I'm like, I know. This is why we put it in there because it's dumb and it's fucked and it shouldn't be there. Yeah. But this is, why, this is why it's in there. So we had to get rid of that. So it's funny, like the cultural the cultural stuff is, is interesting and we are playing to a global audience. So we kind of want to make sure that um, it's funny enough 
that if you if you are, are in America or, mm-hmm. or, or the UK, you can enjoy it. Mm. But if you're Australian, you have another level of um, laughs. Oh, with that's, it. Awesome. So that's awesome. I can't, wait, to that. I can't wait to binge. Listen, is it going to be something where it's all available at once or is it going to come like... It should be, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's, and we haven't started production yet, but so it's... I've never made an audio drama before yeah. and um, I, I understand it's very difficult. So mm-hmm. um, it's going to be very interesting yeah. okay. so that awesome, should mate. be out later on this year uh, wh- how do we end it um, I know that we... good to be with you good yeah, that's <laughs> it. well I want to quickly get clarification you're talking about being a wog Dan Illich or Dan Illich okay so uh, <laughs> I've kind of gone between the two yeah uh, I used to be Illich yeah. and then in high, I hit high school um, mm-hmm. and people just started calling me Illich because uh-huh. that's how you you say it phonetically. Mm-hmm. So then I was Illich for a long time, and then uh, and then media. It was easy just to be Illich uh-huh. because people didn't, people couldn't understand the silent H, uh-huh. um, and no one called like for instance Carlos Stefanovic would never win a gold logie, yeah, but sure. Carl Illich, uh, Carl <laughs> Stefanovic could. Yeah, sure. So I was thinking, oh, media career wise, I'll just co- colonize my name. Twenty nineteen, maybe yeah. Illich. Well, uh, maybe yeah, well, <laughs> when I started doing a lot of seven hundred two radio, I changed it on air to Illich uh, because that way I could be seen as a diversity hire for the ABC. Uh, <laughs> well, and, uh, uh, it hasn't really worked. I, I'm still not employed by the ABC on radio there, but um, I will accept both. And uh-huh. if you ever listen to the podcast, I introduce myself as both. That's well, that's where it was confusing as fuck yeah, because yeah. I normally would just be like, the easiest thing to do is just hear them say their name and then you hear it a couple of different ways. Yeah, I know. Yeah, right. it's, it's, well, I'm playing to two audiences. Yeah. I'm playing to my dad and then the rest of the people. <laughs> well, Dan Illich. Uh, slash Illich. Yeah. Slash uh, Illich. Great to be with you. If, if I need a grant, I'm Illich. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, thanks so much for, for coming on. When you're in Melbourne, it would be great to have you in studio as well. Uh, you've got some epic stories and it it is... Uh, one of those things where it's like podcasting has actually been around for ages mm. and I've seen you doing so much of the shit that everyone's only talking about now and so I'm really excited for the next uh, chapter for you because you were doing the shit that now people are finally fucking talking about. Mm. So Mate, just think- join my TikTok. It's the future. <laughs> <laughs> Did you enjoy Doug, this? Did you have a good time? Yeah, yeah. Great. Yeah. yeah, thanks so much for coming on. Good to be with you. Yeah. Ask me if I enjoyed it. Uh, did you enjoy it? Every minute of it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a daily talk show. Please leave us a review on the Apple Podcast app if you enjoyed it. Otherwise, go fuck yourself. <laughs> See you later. Oh, oh. Is there too much swearing on this podcast? No, no. no, no, no you no. said cunt twice. Oh, I did. I did. <laughs> Maybe bleep the C. Can you bleep the C, no, boss? Definitely not. No, no, no. Good cut right. through. <laughs> See you tomorrow, guys. Catch ya.